I would assume that since all of the aircraft that are due into DFW have landed, uh, there are no military escorts. Now, whether there was a military escort provided to them or not, uh, we're unaware of that. We can take about two more questions, and we're going to have to. Is there a consideration the implosion? Uh, wasn't even a carry-on okay. Uh, we have uh, canceled the implosion uh, party set for this Saturday, and we will uh, look at where we go from here. Thank you, Cecil. Just like to make a brief statement, and then we'll take some questions. Just like to assure you that Military Department of the State of Tennessee, to include TEMA, has been working this issue since it was first brought to our attention this morning. Uh, it continues to be a a uh, hourly changing or less than that event. We are making preparations that we normally do under any circumstances insofar as the security of the citizens of the state of Tennessee and the security of our property. Uh, what that means is, is uh, any when you go through your security checkpoint for those customers who are used to going to the airport, anything on the opposite side of that is called that secure side of the airport. And those are the areas uh, that are being closed to the public. Um, they are still keeping open those areas in front of that. They call that the ATO area, or, or where you can check your bags, that sort of thing, to accommodate any customers' questions and things that might find their way to the airport. So all folks who are stranded are being moved out, essentially? Indeed, and being accommodated, uh, those uh, based upon what the plans are by their respective air carriers, uh, be accommodated in local hotels and things of that nature. That's all. Uh, I'm sorry. One more question, and we're going to have to get back to our business. I talked with passengers out the terminal. They said that people were coming off the plane just having their bags searched for their luggage. Comes out scary. That's possible. That is possible on the part of the air carrier. Okay. Thank you. We'll be back to you. I think the most important thing to take away is that there is no specific threat to this airport, and rest assured that our DPS folks uh, will keep you alerted if anything else uh, is to occur. Thank Kevin, you. what time should we expect another? Break? Well, there you hear the comments from two officials. I have to be perfectly honest, not sure who they are, whether they work for American Airlines or they work for the airport in Dallas, but they were in, 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 in Dallas today, and they say at the end of that news conference there is no specific threat to that airport. Uh, which will be a reassuring to people who are around the airport, but anybody who's wanting to fly anywhere in the country at the moment is unable to do so anyway. But the conditions in the country are of such a confusing nature at the moment that stuff just comes in all the time. We've had authorities in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, tell our affiliate there, WTVQ, just a short while ago, that as a plane is missing from radar in their airspace. And it is simply going to take time in order to... Uh, in order to to sort out whether or not we're looking or at an operation or somehow witnessing or being on the edges of an operation that is continuing to unfold in various parts of the country. We still indeed have a missing aircraft or a missing or not accounted for aircraft from United Airlines. Uh, we had a crash uh, near Pittsburgh here today about which we have only that knowledge, no understanding whatsoever whether or not it is relevant to the others. Um, the, we do know that the president and the vice president, and interestingly enough, former presidents are all now in secure locations. That's Pierre Thomas, our Justice Department reporter, connecting into his sources there to tell us all that. Uh, ABC's John McKenzie, who's out on the streets of New York, has spoken to the New York City Fire Department officials, and they report many missing firemen, perhaps as many as 200. Um, and John Miller, in such assistance here this morning that that will come as no surprise to you because you worked these streets for so long both before you went back to being a reporter as an official with the government and with the police department that's um, right and fire and the fire department stays there i've seen the fire department all my all my professional life stay there till the bitter end well you know they are the people um who are always running in when everybody else is running mm -hmm. out and uh in this case would have been uh, the front line of the evacuating force for the world trade center the fire department has a, uh, a set plan for uh, a disaster at the World Trade Center. It's an automatic second alarm, which brings more than 175 firefighters. This, of course, brought hundreds more. And their job is to go through the building and, uh, and bring those people out. And there's really no telling at what stage of the evacuation they were at or how many of them were still inside when the first building collapsed or the second mm. building collapsed. I remember 30 some, 30 some odd years ago, first coming to New York, and there was a building that collapsed. and the you know, the firefighters are ultimately the ones to die on. I remember almost the very first night I was here at ABC all those years ago. As you say, everybody's going one way and they're going the, and they're going the other way.
John, you've been, I know that you're, you're listening a lot to the network. By this, I mean the police network. And one assumes we're not interrupting and intruding on them. I think that's pretty certain. Give us the general tenor of things at the moment. Right now, it's a situation that's uh, vastly calmed down. Um, as you hear the operations, uh, which I've been monitoring uh, since the beginning, uh, their voices are now level. This is much more about organizing an incredible uh, crime scene second, but first, organizing a massive transport of casualties. They literally have um, passenger ferry boats, police launches, um, and other vessels standing by to uh, ferry people away to outer boroughs, helicopters to do the same thing. It's really a, a tremendous effort to triage the people who are injured to decide uh, who's viable, who can be saved, who needs immediate attention, who can wait, to categorize them and tag them as such, and then to designate whether they can stand uh, a long ride uh, or just a short ride to the nearest available medical help. That's what's going on, and that's uh, an incredibly large effort. On the other side, there's the investigation, which is unfolding, uh, uh, processing uh, probably the largest crime scene in U.S. history, certainly uh, larger than uh, the, the Oklahoma City bombing or even the first World Trade Center bombing, um, or in this case, because of the size of those two buildings, the uh, twin embassy bombings in East Africa. Yeah, and that's the Pentagon we're looking at this morning. And I'm sorry, but we have more bad news. Lisa Stark, who covers aviation from us, reports in from Seattle that um, two United flights have now crashed. Now, just so we don't lose track of the numbers, we told you the United Flight 93 going from New York to San Francisco crashed outside Pittsburgh today. Um, we believe now, according to our aviation sources, that United Flight 175, which was a 767 destined to go from Boston to Los Angeles, has crashed, and we do not know where. So we have four major commercial aircraft which have been involved in either accidents or violence today. We have the two at the Trade Towers in New York City. We're not certain, but we believe both those are somehow connected to American Airlines. We're not sure of that, absolutely sure. And that news conference in Dallas a few minutes ago didn't shed much light on the subject. And we have two United Airlines flights um, involved in crashes. We do not know the circumstances of those crashes. One of them flying from New York, just outside New York to San Francisco, and the other flying from Boston to Los Angeles. And we may or may not have another aircraft because we have no certainty yet what the aircraft was, who it belonged to, really what size it was that penetrated the outer ring of the Pentagon this morning, uh, right through to the inner ring of the Pentagon's courtyard there, and caused what ABC's Jack McQuethy called heavy casualties there. So we have four uh, significant commercial aircraft carrying, in some cases, uh, well more than 100 passengers who've all been a in involved in acts of violence on purpose or, or otherwise today. And, and Mayor Giuliani, the mayor of New York, uh, who will probably get a better feel of this before anybody else at the moment, has now described a tremendous number of lives lost uh, in the New York atta the attack on the New York uh, Trade Towers. And it doesn't come as any great surprise to anybody. The mayor begins to give us some sense of magnitude which is beyond that which which we are merely speculating and or talking about even though we know that many 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 lives have been lost and abc's john mckenzie who's just a couple of blocks away from the world trade center at a makeshift fire command center look at that again i mean it is stunning it, 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 uh, uh, john mcquethy at that makeshift fire command center has had a battalion commander tell him that as many as 200 firefighters are principally unaccounted for. So, so it is no wonder that all across the country today, at airports and at public sites, uh, many, many which have been closed from the west all the way across to the east, people are holding their breath. Don't wish to mellow, be melodramatic about it, are holding their breath. Uh, as to whether or not there is one more, or should I say, another incident to come. And that was because the shock was so profound watching on television as we did this morning to see the second aircraft come in and crash into the other, uh, into the other of the twin trade towers. There it is, 
which have now both collapsed. And it is, in, in some ways, a reminder of what happened when the Challenger exploded and the constant repetition of the explosion of the Challenger on uh, the Challenger space shuttle just drove it into our collective consciousness all across the nation. What we had witnessed uh, together, though, were clearly unable to feel in the same way as those people in the immediate area. I just want to pick up some other reaction coming uh, from around the country and around the world. Um, it's very interesting the reaction we've had immediately, officially, from the highest ranks of the Palestinian Authority and from Afghanistan. Uh, I think we can hear Chairman Arafat, Yasser Arafat, in just a moment, but the Taliban ambassador to Pakistan, uh, it is in Afghanistan where the United States believes Osama bin Laden has been uh, most carefully given sanctuary, if not protected by the Taliban, but the Taliban ambassador to Pakistan has condemned what he called terrorist attacks on the United States on Tuesday. He said in a dispatch from Reuters out of Islamabad in Pakistan, this is a terrorism act and we strongly uh, condemn it. And then from Kabul itself, the capital of Afghanistan, a spokesman for the, for the rulers there said that, that the Saudi dissidents, Osama bin Laden is a Saudi Arabian citizen, um, could not be responsible for a spate of terror attacks in the United States. Um, I don't understand that particularly, but here's the quote from him. It says, what happened in the United States was not a job of ordinary people. It could have been the work of governments. Uh, Osama bin Laden cannot do this work, neither us, said the Taliban spokesman to the Reuters news agency in Kandahar, which is a city on the southern part of, uh, of Afghanistan. This could have been the act of either internal enemies of the United States or its major rivals. Now, there are a couple things. John Miller talked to me about this because you've been to Afghanistan. You went to see Osama bin Laden. Every, in every organization, any, anywhere in the world where governments or organizations have been somehow connected to terrorism in the United States mind, act real or not, people are just waiting. There's going to be some kind of response to this. When Osama bin Laden blew up those embassies, I guess it was before you went into Afghanistan, they uh, attacked his camp, so they didn't get him. They, uh, they sent 75 cruise missiles and a million dollars apiece into his camps based on intelligence that he would be meeting there with his leadership. Right. He was not there, and uh, they didn't get him. They destroyed his camps. Um, I think that at the time or point that the government um, and the Bush administration identifies, not to the standard, and this is the way they've been working, not to the standard you would need to prove in court, but to, uh, to the satisfaction of the administration that they know who's responsible, they will not deal with this as a criminal matter first, uh, but as a military one first, and uh, retaliate against someone somewhere. Uh, too early to say who. One of the things about bin Laden that is so misunderstood, and um, his name has come up a few times today, is how he actually operates. Um, more so than launching these operations himself at his direction from his own organization. And there are instances with, where he's charged with doing exactly that. In many more of the cases, especially of operations they shut down, uh, the U.S. government takes the position that he's uh, basically a foundation, that uh, any terrorist group can approach him and say, we want to go to work. He'll provide the training, the financing, and then send them off to do their work, uh, essentially with grant money seed money, training, uh, logistical support. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be him uh, to have his fingerprints on it. Fires are still burning in the Pentagon, no surprise there. As John McCrethy and Barbara Starr both reported for us, this building penetrated the outer ring of the Pentagon and set many offices on fire on a variety of levels, and there are about six or seven stories. There are one, two, three, four, five, six stories anyway in the Pentagon today. Um, in at least one section, they are alike. And as I said a couple of times, the Palestinian president, Yasser Arafat, who's deeply um, engaged in a war now with the, with the Israeli government, uh, has also uh, reacted very quickly to this today to express, uh, I, probably last, I haven't heard what he said, but so let's hear what he said now, the Palestinian president, Yasser Arafat. First of all, I am offering my con condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the, uh, to the American president, uh, President Bush, to his government, to the American people for this 
terrible act. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Unbelievable. Now, that's the Palestinian president, chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, Yasser Arafat, who, as I think everybody who watches the news or reads the news these days understands, is in a, 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 a very, very bitter war with the Israelis, um, and in, in which uh, terrorism uh, has been a factor. Palestinians see what the Israelis do to them as terrorism, and certainly the Israelis and much of the world see the Palestinian and other suicide bombers who've attacked inside Israel uh, to be terrorism of the most gruesome order. No question about that. And so we should not be surprised, as on previous circumstances, to see Chairman Arafat um, expressing his condolences, but other Palestinians who believe the United States is responsible for what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, or at least complicit, and is certainly supplying the Israelis' arms, will be happy to see this attack on the United States today. So take a look at a scene from Jerusalem not too long ago in which there is some celebration that the powerful United States has been harmed, has been seen to be vulnerable, has been hurt, I suppose, in the broadest sense of the world. And, and the people who go off to do this sort of thing, both in the Middle East and now, you must remember that a vast majority of the, uh, vast majority of the population of the Middle East now in, in all countries is under 21, much of it under 15, certainly under 17, and, and the kind of tensity and intention, if one presumes this, this terrorism, one shouldn't, this terrorism has come, had its genesis or had its roots somewhere in the Middle East, um, or at least in people who are opposed, uh, have, uh, have, uh, are just filled, brimming, brimming with anger at the United States. And we are now becoming more experienced with the notion that there are young men, for the most part, uh, who are prepared to uh, blow themselves up along with everybody else in terms if they can be if they can be a service to the cause and it, it, it and, and they believe and they believe as to some people believe about Islam that they will by sacrificing themselves go on to another place it's an unfair comment on Islam uh, in, some, in, in some respects but it is certainly a motivating factor the, the hatred of the United States and the hatred of the United States is a patron of Israel. Whether you're, from, whether you're from Afghanistan or whether you're from Iran, Iraq, or inside the Palestinian territories, is so intense at some levels and has become more intense in recent months that nobody will be, a great many people will not be surprised at this attack today, though, like everybody else, will be amazed at the magnitude and success of it. John McCrethy at the Pentagon. John. Peter, we are standing outside the Pentagon at this point. It has been already a long morning for rescue workers and police here. Uh, one eyewitness I talked to who was on this busy highway outside the Pentagon this morning said he saw an airplane coming directly over his head. It was an American Airlines plane. He could see the number on the plane. He could almost see the passengers inside as it went along the highway, started clipping off the uh, high wires and the different light poles along the highway and slammed directly into the side of the Pentagon. As we said earlier, Peter, the aircraft penetrated deep inside the Pentagon. It is uh, organized in rings from the E ring on the outside. It penetrated all the way into the A ring in the inner part of the Pentagon. Uh, after it burned for a number of minutes, a part of the building collapsed by the time rescue workers could get in there, the destruction was just terrific. So John, do you have any sense of the casualties? Uh, we don't have any sense, Peter, except the size of the medical operation that has been set up here is enormous. Uh, they are anticipating the casualties. Certainly the injured will be in the hundreds. Uh, I certainly don't want to speculate on those killed. And John, it, it, it's a little hard to get, to, to get a sense of the size sometimes for the picture. Can you describe maybe in feet or in yards how big a, how big a penetration this is? The roof has collapsed, Peter. There is a chasm in the side of the Pentagon that is probably 200 or 300 feet across. Mm -hmm. um, from the roof of the Pentagon, there is this huge V shape that has collapsed. You can see deep inside the Pentagon from the street now. This is into the inner courtyard of the Pentagon itself. 
It's into the innermost ring of the Pentagon, Peter. Uh, I have not been able to get into the courtyard, but I was told that the penetration was all the way into the deepest ring of the Pentagon. And John, it, it, the office building, the Pentagon is about, what, six stories high? It's uh, five stories mm -hmm. above ground, Peter, and several stories below. Uh, clearly, the damage uh, is primarily above ground, but also some of those in the lower offices. I was sitting in the Pentagon when the uh, attack happened. I was on the opposite side of the building. It shook the entire building. It was very clear that something terrible had happened. Uh, there was chaos immediately after the attack, Peter. Secretary of Defense, I walked out with the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, the Marine Corps Commandant couldn't get out the door because security had locked it. Uh, it was chaos. Okay, John, thank and the fires are still, are still burning at the moment, we believe? They are still burning. They are mostly oil fires, it appears, Peter. Uh, the fire hoses have been on the, uh, the various fires for the last several hours, so they're beginning to put them out. But obviously, there is still heavy gray smoke coming out of that portion of the Pentagon that was so terribly damaged. And John, there are a couple of aircraft, at least, around the country today which are still unaccounted for. You gave a very clear description earlier of how this aircraft had approached the Pentagon. But did anybody able to identify it as an aircraft associated with an airline? Absolutely, Peter. The eyewitness I talked to looked up and said it was an American Airlines plane. I saw it clear as could be. It went right over the top of my car and clipped a pole right in front of where my car was. Thank you very much, John McCarthy. I actually think that you may have said that earlier, and I simply, I, I simply lost it in terms uh, j just lost it and so we now know that it was from at least one eyewitness there it was an American Airlines aircraft which which uh, which crashed into the Pentagon so we let me just bring you try to get some grasp on the airplane we have two United flights a 757 which was on its way from New York to San Francisco which crashed um, near Pittsburgh we have a United flight which crashed from Boston to Los Angeles United 175 and we do not know where that aircraft has crashed or been crashed as of now. And we have these two American flights, uh, one from Boston to Los Angeles, um, which is a 767 with 81 passengers and 11 crew on board, talking about almost 100 people on American Flight 11. And American Flight 77, which was, which was scheduled from Washington to Los Angeles, uh, with 58 passengers and six crew members on board. And John Miller and I have been sitting here looking at each other about where these flights were going and there's several ways to speculate about it but you came up with one very interesting on from, a, from a forensic standpoint if you if you look operationally uh, to, to crash these flights it would have been just as simple to get on the the Washington shuttle or the New York shuttle mm -hmm. and crash one into the Trade Center and the other in the Pentagon the choice of flights here Newark to San Francisco Boston to LA Dulles to LA uh, excuse me John I apologize let me gonna come back just because we have the New York governor here sure governor George Pataki the governor of New York I believe is on the telephone or somewhere governor Pataki do you hear me yes Peter I hear you fine well why don't you first start off sir and give us your appraisal of the day so well far. it's just uh, it's just a horrific scene and uh, everybody's pulling together we're activating the state emergency forces but uh, our hearts and prayers are with uh, the victims and the families of those victims and we have to at this point just focus on trying to help as many people whose lives are at risk as possible and dealing with those who have been injured. Do you have some sense of the magnitude of casualties? Uh, we don't want to quantify a number, but obviously it's a horrific incident that uh, uh, that really is, is just an, a, an incredible outrage against the people of New York and the people of America. Uh, but uh, at this point, our focus is on trying to make sure that those whose lives are still at risk are as protected and those who have been injured are treated as quickly and as well as possible. Governor, do you believe that thousands of people have been killed? Uh, I don't want to use a number, Peter. At this point, the goal is, uh, is simply to try to help as many people as possible. We're working closely with the city, with our National Guard forces coming in to help relieve the, the city police and fire. Uh, obviously, it's a situation that uh, just cries out for uh, people to, to be horrified. And uh, But what we have to do at this point is focus on uh, helping those who are at risk, helping those who have been injured, making sure there's an orderly removal from lower Manhattan. And, and that is our focus at this point. Governor, have you, have you, are you in a position to go to the scene? Are you in a position to go to lower Manhattan? Do you think you should? Would you like to? Uh, or are you, are you locked down? No, I'm, a, I'm in the city, uh, but the important thing is to be able to stay in contact with the White House, with City Hall, with our statewide emergency services. We've gotten uh, offers of support.
support from all the surrounding states with their emergency services. And the critical thing right now is to be able to coordinate to make sure that the response is the strongest and the, the most compassionate it can be for the people whose lives are still at risk. And okay. we're mobilizing National Guard units from across the state. We're getting help from the surrounding states and coordinating with the city. And that's what we're doing. That's what we have to do at this point. And Governor, what have you done about the other so-called high-profile target, potential targets in New York City, like the UN and the bridges and things like uh, this? Are they all locked? Are they all evacuated uh, and locked down? UN, there? UN's evacuated. The tunnels have been closed. The the, the uh, George Washington Bridge is open under security for emergency services coming in and uh, people going out. We've shut down most of the mass transit. Grand Central is open under very tight security, but people who pass through the security are uh, have limited service. To the, to the northern suburbs, and we're doing the same thing on Long Island. But uh, the important thing now is to provide as much help as quickly and as effectively to those whose lives are at risk or those who've been injured, and we're working with the city and the federal officials to make sure that happens. Do you believe that New York City is now under control? New York City has been under attack, uh, and until we get through this, uh, we just have to continue to respond as, as strongly as we can. And are you in a in a in a profile now? Are you in a position where you actually think there's there's a potential for more? Uh, we just don't know. That's why we have to not only help those who have been injured, but also take every security step we can to try to prevent further incidents. We just don't know, Peter. Okay, Governor Pataki, thank you very much, Governor George Pataki of New York who is in New York City, um, which of course is where he probably belongs at a, at a moment like this. Downtown Manhattan is saying simply that the National Guard has been called in, the tunnels are closed, the George Washington Bridge, which is across, uh, which goes across the Hudson River um, from, uh, from the west side of Manhattan into New Jersey. Just remember a large segment of the, or large, Many thousands of people from New Jersey work in New York, and there's tremendous commerce back and forth on a daily basis. That has all been brought to a help. It's interesting to recall, John Miller, that the attack on the Trade Towers in 93 was launched from New Jersey, or at least the operational headquarters of the people who attacked the Trade Center were in New Jersey. Correct. Uh, and the, uh, the building of the bomb and uh, the original conspiracy was all carried out in towns right across the river. In mm -hmm. fact, the conspirators uh, later admitted that they watched from New Jersey to see if the buildings would in fact fall. And they didn't. They this did. time they did. They did today. And Governor Pataki trying, as politicians again must on occasions like this, trying to express uh, the horror and the commitment that the political establishment feels to those people who've died and those people who need to be rescued. It's an answer to every question about whether or not something was locked down or something. He came back every time that their priority now is to try to help those people who are in deep and in some cases still desperate trouble. Um, George Stephanopoulos, um, one of our senior reporters, is downtown. Hey, George, where have you been? What have you seen? What do you think? Well, Peter, I'm going to give you kind of a pool report from several of our correspondents down here of basically what happened down here in downtown New York between 945 and 1045 when the two explosions and the collapse of the World Trade Center happened. Uh, at the time, I was actually in the subway heading towards the World Trade Center right around Franklin Street. And after the first explosion, the subway station started to fill with smoke. The subway cars started to fill with smoke, and the subways actually stopped. Uh, they then diverted us around the World Trade Center to Park Place, which is one, one stop beyond the World Trade Center. We, we got to that train station at around 10.35, Peter, and it was a scene unlike I've ever seen before in my entire life. As we tried to get out of the subway station and walk up into the street, it was pitch black, midnight black, snowing soot all down through downtown Manhattan. This was about two blocks from the World Trade Center. You couldn't see a foot in front of your face at that time. We then worked our way back uptown. All of the firefighters and police officials and National Guard are now evacuating everyone out of lower, lower Manhattan. They're going east towards Brooklyn and north, which is where we are now, up on Canal Street. I should add as well, Peter, we had one of our reporters was, down, was downtown and had a, a sight line of the World Trade Center around 948, which is around the time I believe the first tower collapsed, Gloria Rivera, and she saw two, then three, then four people jump out of the top floors of the World Trade Center. She was with a firefighter who said, they're not falling, they're jumping. Watch their arms waving, and they counted a dozen people jump off the top floors. Uh, do you want to continue, George? 
Well, I'm just right now, they, as I said, they are evacuating everyone else out. But just to give you another sense, Peter, the, all over lower Manhattan, the, the sidewalks, the streets are covered with about a quarter to half inch of dust, of soot, uh, as if it were Pompeii. Most people are pretty calm right now. They're evacuating slowly as the firefighters come in. Um, but, but it really was one of the most frightening, horrific scenes I've ever seen uh, in my life. Thanks, George, very much. Uh, come back any time with a report. I just, as you were concluding there, watching these guys go up that escalator, and if it's in the World Trade Center, we assume that we know that their cameraman got out, but we don't know about anybody else because, uh, you know, within an hour and something of the time these two attacks had occurred, these two buildings had completely disappeared. And Good morning, I'm Bob Mueller in the News 2 Newsroom. We're going to keep you updated with the pictures from New York City and Washington, D.C. We also want to keep you updated on what's happening in Washington and here in Nashville. On the phone with us, Senator Bill Frist of Tennessee. And Senator, I guess the people of my father's generation will remember the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The people of today will remember this horrible attack on the nation. What's going on in Washington right now? Bob, I think you're right. This has been a horrific day uh, thus far, and we hope and pray that... Uh that the worst part is over. It is really unprecedented, especially in view of the terrorist uh, activity. It's been planned out. It's obviously heavily financed. It has uh, been very systematic in approach, probably state-sponsored, uh, based on what we know and what information has been made available to the Foreign Relations Committee, though we don't know that at this juncture. Senator, obviously this was highly orchestrated. What does this say about not only security in the nation, but security about hearing these things in advance from the U.S. government. Well, you know, we I think we're going to go back and, and re-examine uh, every bit of this again and again and again. This is going to be relived uh, uh, over and over. We just had a hearing on the Foreign Relations Committee last uh, week uh, about terrorism, bioterrorism, and, and the fact that now that the Cold War is over, this terrorist activity in many ways is, is going to be the, the, the greatest, at least domestic, threat. It has uh, been a tragic day. I'm in Washington uh, now, and and uh, we've had aircraft flying over right now, uh, hoping that nothing else will happen here. We uh, were evacuated from the Capitol uh, shortly after the events today. Uh, leadership has set up a command center outside of Washington, our, our congressional leadership. Uh, so there's still a, a whole lot of chaos that has been going on uh, uh, here in Washington, the Pentagon is uh, the fires continue to burn there. We don't know how much loss of life. Senator, have you been in contact or heard any messages from the president yet? We do know that he is on his way back, obviously from Florida. Uh, not directly, but have been in touch with uh, the administration uh, again as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee and as a member of Senate leadership. We're uh, right now uh, have a command center that is set up. Uh, we will be hearing something shortly from the administration uh, very directly. As we talk, sir, I don't want to interrupt you, but just we're showing video. It's, it's, it's horrifying pictures. It's before the Trade Center collapses, and you can see people leaning out windows. Obviously, they did not survive when the Trade Center collapsed. There's going to be an unprecedented loss of life. I mean, it could be as, as much as 50,000 or more, just guesstimating, could have lost their lives today. Well, there's no question. And, and if you look at their 10 or 12,000 people in, that, in, in each of those towers in the morning, here at the Pentagon, about uh, just not too far from where I'm sitting uh, right now, the fire is, is getting under control, but it started spreading a little bit from the south to the north. At least four floors collapsed there where the an aircraft, I'm not sure how much has been reported about that, an aircraft, an airplane struck uh, the Pentagon. And uh, uh, the attention there is, 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 is focused a lot now regionally here as we speak. And again, how much loss of life there? We have no earthly idea. Senator, talk a little bit about your other expert expertise. Obviously, you are a physician. What is going on in trauma centers around New York City and Washington, D.C., as they try to help people who have survived this? What kind of injuries are going to be seen? Well, it's really a, a triage system that's set up. And uh, uh, in New York City, there's probably the most sophisticated uh, f first responder team that includes uh, uh, terrorist activity, including bioterrorism. Uh, there have been a number of, of um, trial runs in the past, so although I'm not there, I know, because I've had them come testify before our committees, that, that they're prepared for an event. Obviously, they had the World Trade Center event there before, again, so we're probably as prepared as, as one might be. It can always be better. Burns is, is the number one issue. Burns, which uh, 
uh, can be horrific in terms of outcome, but which, if there's appropriate triage, can be treated uh, aggressively and quickly. You don't know the final impact till just weeks uh, down the line. Uh, the injuries at the World Trade Center will mainly be crush injuries, and there'll be a huge loss of life uh, uh, from that uh, uh, event, as you w- witness that on TV. Here in Washington, it'll be predominantly burn injury because of the fire that's resulted at the Pentagon at the heliport. Senator, obviously what we saw on television today after the first impact at the Trade Center, we saw the, the airplane, the second plane, crash into the Trade Center. Is there really any way to stop this? If someone wants to hijack an airplane and do what they did today, obviously it can happen. Well, again, uh, we're gonna have, we'll have to go back and look at all the appropriate procedures. Uh, we have four airplanes now that, uh, as we speak, that are, have been involved, and I would say at least four. Um, uh, the two at the World Trade Center, then the two United flights, one that uh, went down uh, a few hours ago outside Pittsburgh or 80 miles south of Pittsburgh, and then there's one other United flight. The fact that four uh, uh, at the same time uh, could be hijacked uh, uh, mean that we're going to have to do something and do something different. We've been blessed in this country. Uh, uh, to date, I've never seen anything like that, but now that it's occurred, we'll have to go back and review in a systematic way, a thoughtful way, a careful way to make sure that there are appropriate uh, precautions there. Senator, is what happened today an act of war, and who would, who would it be an act of war against? Well, it is an act of war. There's no question that of something of this size, and, and uh, as people do compare it to, to 60 years ago in, at, at Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, this is every bit uh, as much an act of war as that was. And I think that's where the comparison, not just in loss of, of life and numbers, but the fact this is an act of war. Uh, I have to be careful what I say, but, but I think the obvious thing is that because of the money involved, the sophistication involved, the, the, uh, the fact it was able to be carried out without anybody knowing anything about, as you said, means it's highly orchestrated and takes a huge amount of money and to have that much money means that in some way it's likely to have some sort of state sponsorship. Senator, if we find out, and we probably will find out who's responsible for this, are you confident that justice will preserve? Yes, I, you know, there's uh, justice, uh, there's, no, there's no way to preserve justice <laughs> at this point, but I think that accountability will be complete, uh, and I think that it is very important that that message is sent uh, in order to preclude things like this, tragedies, horrific incidents like this happening in the in the future. Uh, that's where we both, as the United States Congress and uh, as the administration under the leadership of the President of the United States, will have to take decisive action, firm mm-hmm. action in a reasonable way. What do you say to the country today, Senator, and sp- specifically here, folks in Tennessee, your, your elected officials, or your folks that you represent, Obviously, they're glued to television sets, watching this, wanting to hear reassurance. What, what are the words well, that will know, come from you and the president? I later? think the fact that we're talking now and uh, uh, at the same time that evacuation is going on and you have thousands of people uh, evacuating uh, federal buildings throughout Washington, D.C., the fact that thousands of people have died, and we've seen this tragedy, but at the same time, the strength of our government and of our American people and the will of those people can come together, can address the issues, will address the issues. We're not going to back down from terrorism. We will show America and the world and the countries, including the terrorist nations, that justice will ultimately uh, prevail. And it starts today. I think clearly, and we haven't talked very much about it, but as you see those pictures on television and you see the people who are coming out with burns and are being treated, and that's what we'll be seeing later this afternoon and tonight. We've got thousands of people going to hospitals right now as we speak, to those hospital workers, to the health care personnel, to the emergency personnel. We say thank you, and then our, 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 our prayers go out to the families that have been affected so directly uh, by this terrorist horrific horrendous activity. Senator, as you're well aware, this country bands together in time of crisis. We seem to get stronger. Do you expect that to happen this time? There's no question. I mean, what's made this country great is is that in times of crisis that we're able to work through it by calling upon what has made the country great, and that is the American spirit. And it uh, is going to be called upon. He is being called upon now. It will be called upon over the next uh, few week, days and weeks, and it will go on into months and years. Senator Bill Frist in Washington, D.C., we greatly appreciate your time in this National Day of Tragedy. Uh, we will be speaking with you later and wish you the best in Washington as you wish the best of the country. Thank you very much for your time, Senator. Thank you.
I'm Bob Mueller in the News 2 Newsroom. We will return now to continuing coverage of the terrorist attack from ABC. We will bring you more local updates as we get new information. Again, Newark to San Francisco, Boston to L.A., Dulles to Los Angeles, uh, Washington to L.A., Boston to L.A. Um, the planes that are being looked at in this, uh, in this attack today mm -hmm. were apparently, or you could speculate, chosen for to give the terrorists the very biggest bang uh, for their effort. Mm. And it's a very interesting point you make because, again, our assumptions tend to go when we see huge explosions like this. None of us understanding visually the power of explosives, that, that there were explosives on board. And so you're quite right. They may indeed have, it may indeed have been the aircraft explosion. I mean, John Nance could help us with this, but when you hear the, the amount of fuel, um, very flammable uh, aeronautical fuel that's loaded onto a plane for a 3,000-mile trip or something, um, that's going to give you quite an explosion. Uh, flight 800, which was an international flight, uh, okay. to those who saw it, was an incredible explosion. Uh, John, if you'd sit, sit at your station for a second, I'm just going to go and try to check one piece of information. And in, the, in that period of time, we're going to try to give you a little better sense of, of, uh, of what's... Of the, of, the, of the disaster at the Trade Towers today. Here, here's something we've compiled, and we compile it as we go along. I was standing next to One World Trade Center, and then all of a sudden I heard rumbling, and we all started running away from it. The glass, like, blew out and threw me onto the sidewalk, and I, I couldn't see for, like, 20 seconds. And then I started seeing vaguely the street, and I, I just started walking, and I started, my eyesight came back. I see you're, you're bloody. You have dust all over you. Yeah, it was bad. It was like a dust storm or something. Like, I couldn't see anything. How badly are you hurt? I have no idea. As soon as you got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. We just come out of Tower One. We're walking towards Broadway. They're saying, move along, move along, move along. I looked up as soon as we got across the street. I looked up, I saw the building start, the tower start to buckle. I just tur turned and ran, ducked down, put a jacket over my head. Three or four of us huddled together, and uh, it was uh, just black everywhere. Were you covered? Were you Smoke. hit with debris? No, 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 no. But I mean, I was ducked behind a subway cover. So I put a, you know, with the jacket over, the three of us, you know, all of us huddled together. There was, you know, dust and whatnot everywhere, but it was... can't even look at it because all I can see are people. I don't see a building. I see people. People hurt. Children without mothers and fathers tonight. <laughs> if you're just joining us, you probably already know the World Trade Center towers, the Twin Towers, the New York landmarks have collapsed and are gone. The Pentagon has been hit by a, a airplane, a series of hijackings apparently today um, at the root of this. What we know is hundreds, if not thousands, are injured, uh, no count on the deceased yet, and that the investigation, a massive investigation, is just beginning to unfold. But John, I, the re I stepped aside there, among other things, the moment to try to get some sort of sense from people who talk to, because as soon as this happens, people begin to think about a response, and we don't expect a response to come in, in the immediate future by any means, but I was just talking to Charlie Gibson, uh, from Good Morning America, and and he'd been thinking about the same thing, that the response to this from the United States is going to have to be massive. They have to accomplish something in some way, because so much of the response to terrorism before by a large nation such as this, which is not impotent, but very limited in, in its capacity to operate at this kind of level. You were mentioning earlier the attacks against Osama bin Laden's training camps in Afghanistan. In retrospect, they spent, as you pointed out, more than a million dollars per cruise missile. I forgot how many they sent. No, they didn't get anything. They didn't get anything. They didn't do anything. So it's a very, it's an enormous challenge for for a powerful nation to uh, to to respond in a, in an effective way. And the Pentagon is still burning. And today, the World Trade Center towers have gone. Uh, Diane Sawyer is is down uh, in Times Square at the moment, and among other things, I think has been trying to get some grasp of the number of casualties involved. And it must be very difficult, Diane. It's impossible, Peter, no matter how many people you call. And of course, no matter what the facts we get now, one can only imagine what the facts will be later. 
I want to give you a sense of what it's like here in Times Square right now. Because if you look outside, we have hundreds upon Roger. hundreds upon hundreds of people standing outside, just stopping still, a kind of respectful witness looking up at the screens where we're broadcasting the pictures. They can't hear the sound. They are simply looking at the wordless horror and standing to show, in a way, respect. And I want to show you something else, because people have been sent home from Times Square and across the way, the construction workers who were building the Toys R Us building next door to us just hung their signs outside. God bless America and pray for families and victims. And we can only, of course, add to that that as crisply as we try to report what's happening here today, we join them. And this is not just another story, even for reporters who have been trained to do this for so long. A few things to add since this morning. We were on the air, of course, live when suddenly we get word of that first explosion at the World Trade Center, the first building. And initially, of course, we didn't know if it was an accident. We didn't know what had happened. And then we were on the air live when the second plane came in and the second plane hit. And I want to show you now. This is what we were seeing live on the air. And as you've expressed before, Peter, the combination of disbelief and horror and simple prayer for somebody to save the people who were inside that building is all anybody can do as an entire network is broadcasting live something so unimaginable. I have talked, as you all have, and as George Stephanopoulos reported, to the people who were inside as these scenes were taking place. We now see the first collapse, which of course took place about 10 a.m. Eastern time. And then it would be about 28 minutes later that we would see the second collapse of the second building. And while we're watching the scene, each person desperate, desperate to stop this tape and go and do something. All we can do is relive the horror each time we see it. I have talked to people who are inside the building, one of them, Fran Martin, who is the aunt of someone who works here at ABC, and she was saying that the first experience inside the building was that earthquake-like feeling a number of people have mentioned. And then something else, in an eerie, silent, uh, kind of mournful foliage, you saw paper just wafting out in all directions. And it was so mysterious to everyone. They couldn't imagine what had happened. The paper was scattering. And we've now read some three miles out, way across the river, the paper from those floors. As they came down the stairs, we're told that people were remarkably calm, were remarkably respectful of each other as they were making their way down, even though a number of them had lived through that bombing eight years ago. A number of them remembered what it was when the bomb went off in the basement of the World Trade Center. And of course, as we now know, if the cyanide gas had not vaporized in those bombs, that it would have been a cataclysm even beyond what was experienced then, so they could all relive it as they were making their way down. Now, we're watching the scenes as the building is collapsing, and people are running from it. People are covered with this kind of spectral suit from the building's collapse itself. I want to point out again, and you've talked about it too, Peter, all the firefighters were immediately called on duty. All the firefighters immediately raced in from wherever they were to help out all the emergency medical service personnel. This was a great display of human concern and human consideration. And you've mentioned before, we have this report that 200 firefighters are now missing, and yet they have done everything they can. Every hospital is open, every hand is on deck, every doctor is standing by in the city of New York with um, all this courage and struggle and still heartbreak out there in the streets right now. So that's it from Times Square, Peter. Thank you very much, Diane. I remember uh, working uh, with Diane on the Millennium broadcast on New Year's Eve 2000. Diane had such a joyful time in, in Times Square. It is, uh, whatever you think of New York in general, it is a place where people from around the world gather to express themselves. And so we'll go back there on, 
on occasion to, to get some, you really get some sense of the world in Times Square. And President Bush has been on the phone uh, today to a variety of world leaders, um, clearly discussing this with them at the highest possible level. And perhaps they're all as confused as the rest of us are as to what has happened, who perpetrated these acts of terrorism in the United States, and what is to be done in response. Though this is perhaps, we're only four hours since this actually happened, and perhaps it is not quite the time to begin to think about the precision of a response, but a response will be required of some magnitude that will mean something from the United States if one is able to, ever able to pin that down exactly who the perpetrators were. Uh, we told you that the president was in Florida this morning where he'd intended to talk about education today and was coming back to Washington. Um, he's made it as far as Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana where he landed um, about an hour and a bit ago um, just before noon Eastern time where he's made a statement to the cameras which we haven't got our hands on yet but the president uh, said that the president uh, said that freedom had been attacked, but freedom will be defended. And the president is in touch with his national security team. Anne Compton, ABC's Anne Compton, who covers the White House for us for many years from us, tells us that jet fighters, uh, jet fighters accompanied Air Force One and that as best we can tell, uh, the Air, Air Force One was flying at a particularly high altitude. There are no planes taking off or landing in, or taking off in the United States at the moment with the, possible, with the exception of Air, Swan, Air Force One, though the Federal Aviation Administration says at the moment that 50 known aircraft, this is actually a few minutes old, 50 known aircraft are all in the sky uh, within approximately 50 miles of their destination. So you can feel across the country that aircraft that were in flight are beginning to settle down. They were ordered to settle down by the FAA and to land at the nearest possible airport. And so that has begun to work out. Now, in, in Washington, I think Claire Shipman uh, at, the, at the White House or near it has some further information about the president. Yes, Claire. Well, that's right, Peter. What, essentially, what we've learned is what he told the pool cameras a few minutes ago, and we're hopefully going to see in just a few minutes. But he said that the he and this government have taken steps to ensure the functioning of the United States government, that the U.S. military is on high alert at home and abroad. He said he has taken all appropriate security measures to protect Americans. He says freedom itself has been attacked and freedom will be protected. And finally, he also said he will hunt down and punish those responsible for this. Again, we're hoping to see him in person, but as you mentioned, it looks as though this may be the secure place that they've decided on for, um, for the president, at least temporarily, Barksdale Air Force Base in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. I'd be really curious, Claire, and I realize how difficult it is at the moment, whether or not there's not pressure, political pressure in Washington from the members of the president's own staff and cabinet for him to, to, to show up soon. Uh, in front of the country and assure them beyond his statement that freedom has been attacked and freedom will be defended, of course, because it wasn't defended this morning. Well, I think whether or not the president will be seen in command in a more vigorous way. I think you're absolutely right, and I'm sure it's a delicate balance right now between the Secret Service and those who are trying to protect the president, keeping him out of sight and someplace secure, and, and his political advisors who would clearly like to see him make a statement. You saw how quickly he did it this morning, as brief as it was, and certainly a piece of tape that we're going to see in a, in a few minutes, we hope, um, is, not, is not what they would like to see the president uh, doing right now. They would like to see him making something of a more formal statement. But again, it could be a number of hours before the president is back in Washington and prepared to, to talk to us from that forum. Okay, thanks very much, Claire. We'll come back to you anytime you, anytime you want. And again, none of us should be surprised at what's happening. First of all, Secret Service is a huge, powerful, authoritative organization which takes these, the uh, president's safety and other members of the senior political leadership with deep and profound seriousness, but they have enormous power. And so if you're talking between a senior political official and the president's secret service official of equal stature at the moment, who's going to win that argument at the moment? And this is particularly true in a situation which continues to unfold because while the devastation, the, the, uh, the, perhaps the grand or the greatest devastation has occurred in New York City tomorrow morning, it's, this morning it's also occurred in outside Washington at the, at the Pentagon and, and the, the 
tension is there all across the country because not only were the United Nations and various government buildings evacuated here in New York City, but the Sears Tower in Chicago, the tallest skyscrapers in Boston and Cleveland and Minneapolis, and the Space Needle in Seattle. So the, uh, the psychological effect on people in the country is huge. It may indeed be settling down after several hours, but the president and his response to this is also part of the psychological package because the country looks to the president on occasions like this to be reassuring to the nation. Some presidents do it well and some presidents don't. But ABC's Ann Compton is with the president at the moment and we have her on the telephone. Annie. Peter, it has been a frightening couple of hours for President Bush. We took off in Air Force One from Florida, where he first got word of this. And we literally, Peter, have been flying at well over 40,000 feet uh, west. The White House unable to tell us where we were headed or how long it would take. There were jet fighters off the wing just out of our sight until we landed. And the president has spent the time on board the aircraft talking not only to world leaders, but to the vice president, uh, to his cabinet. He even checked in with Mrs. Bush, uh, trying to get more information. We were high enough so that the Air Force was actually able to get some television signal. Uh, we don't know much about what's gone on on the ground, but he has been able to see some of it on a very fuzzy uh, television picture. We landed here at Barksdale Air Force Base. This is near Shreveport, Louisiana at about 11.45 Eastern Time. We were not allowed to use cell phones or give you any indication of where we were until local people noticed the plane on the ground. The president has just made a statement, Peter, a very emotional one, saying that freedom has been attacked, but freedom will be defended, saying that America's military is on its highest state of alert. World leaders have been uh, assure that the U.S. will do whatever it takes to protect America and Americans. Frankly, Peter, I thought the president not only looked grim, very solemn, but his eyes looked somewhat red. Annie, let me ask you a couple of questions, if I, if I may. First of all, the president was on a, on a education trip, ostensibly, in Florida. Today. How much of the national security team was with him? Uh, this is actually a skeleton team with him on a short, uh, it was a trip that lasted only about 24 hours. He was just making his last appearance before returning to Washington. And Carl Rove, one of his senior counselors, is with him. Uh, and his press secretary, Ari Fleischer, but none of the national security apparatus, such as Condoleezza Rice, who would ordinarily travel with the president on a more substantive trip. But on Air Force One, of course, he has the full resources of communications, uh, but he does not have the full team with him. Well, let's talk about this for a second, because when the president took off from Florida and went immediately to 40,000 feet, and I believe actually got a fighter escort for part of the way, it reminds one a little bit of what it was like in the Cold War, because the Cold War, there was always a provision that the senior members of the government, president included, could in fact run the country from a command center in the sky. Is Ab that basically what's happening this morning? Absolutely. In fact, the U.S. used to have five aircraft, now Air Force One. Let me know if we're being taken out of here. Uh, we may be scrambled out of here. Okay. Are we leaving? Okay, Peter, the, we are leaving. And Where are I, you going, Annie? Peter, I have no idea. They have not told us. They have kept us. Uh, uh, we don't even know whether we'll be able to see the president or travel with him, but we are told that he's been traveling. He will continue. They are still quite worried about his own security. Off you go, and Anne, thanks very much for Thank a you. very, very full report on on the state of, and, and perhaps even a little bit of the, of the uh, mental condition of the president at, at the moment. And we cannot state it often enough. Uh, the country looks to him, and so he may have stopped at Barksdale Air Force Base in, in, in Louisiana, which is just where Arkansas and Texas and Louisiana all, all come together uh, at an Air Force Base uh, out of the way, and he may be safe at 40,000 feet in, in, in Air Force One, but before long, uh, the country is going to expect him to be back in Washington to send, if not only a message, not just a message to those of us in the nation, who look to the president for some sense of political national stability, but also to the other parts of the world where these enemies of the United States, with whom we've, whom we've talked quite a lot about today, at the moment must surely think they have the United States on the run to some extent. And while the Taliban, the political leadership, military, political, military religious leadership in, in Afghanistan said this morning 
that, that they condemned this and had nothing to do with it and it could not have been Osama bin Laden because he wasn't sophisticated enough to do it and had to be a country or a government certainly. And while the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat, came out and put as much distance as they could between th them and, and the Palestinian people, this active in the Palestinian people, the president needs to be on station to talk it. As does the mayor of New York, and Mayor Giuliani is with us at the moment. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? I can, Peter. Mr. Mayor, I saw you several times on the street today, and it, it looked like you were deeply sharing the horror that all of us feel. But I'd really appreciate, aside from on top of your sentiments about all this, give us some sense of what's going on. What, what is going on now is a massive uh, rescue effort. We have thousands of police officers and firefighters in all of Manhattan trying to rescue as many people as we possibly can. Uh, there are still a lot of people there that are injured, hurt, dazed, and we're trying to get them out. And we're mobilizing all of our fire, police, and emergency resources to do that. The governor has alerted the National Guard, and they're being deployed to come and relieve us early to later this afternoon. And uh, the urban search and rescue teams are uh, coming here from, from around the country to also assist us. But until then, which means until probably 2, 3, 4 o'clock this afternoon, our police department, our fire department, and our emergency people are being stretched to the limit, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we've also lost a significant number of them. Are you, are you, you're, you're reluctant, I assume, to put any other name attached to the casualties except significant. Do you believe it's hundreds or thousands? I, I, I really don't. I really, I really don't want to say right now, Peter. I, I think it's going to.